This talk has no purpose. I'm going to repeat that. This talk has no purpose. It will not make you happier, healthier, wealthier, wiser. It will not help you lose weight or help you make quick and easy weeknight meals for your family. <laughs> However, that does not mean that it's purposeless. And I'm drawing a distinction here because so much of what we do every day is driven by the sense of getting a return on what we're doing, of um, having the end result in mind. And what I found is that very often this sense of purpose, this sense of end result can sap the life and the meaning right out of what we're doing. So I'm here to talk about my way of combating this. And I think that one of the first times that I became aware of this was several years ago. I was in a toy store with, with my children walking around. And we found ourselves in the early childhood aisle section. And I, I was the sort of baby area, but it's early childhood, sorry. And um, it must have been before I had a cell phone because I actually was looking around at things and when my kids were running around looking at stuff. I noticed something unusual. And what I noticed was that they had a section of balls. Now these balls were not in a bin or anything like that. They were in individually wrapped in cardboard boxes which I thought was kind of unusual. So I have boredom or curiosity. I just picked it up. I was wondering what made this ball so special that it had its own box. And I started to read it. And what I found appalled me. And it shocked me. And it was something along the lines of, <clears throat> quote unquote, balls can help sequencing skills, motor planning, dexterity, fine motor skills, attention to task, and socialization skills. End quote. Really? I wasn't aware of that. Silly me. I thought it was just a ball. Who knew? That it could have such life-changing potential. That playing with a ball could help my attention to task. Something that probably any guy my age could really use. Oh, a simple ball. A sphere. The most perfect shape. The ancient Greeks would call it the most perfect shape. I mean... And they knew a thing or two about shapes. Something that the youngest child, even an infant, somehow intuitively knows to grab, maybe mouth, play with, roll, has been turned into something that is good for us, good for the child, that we have to use. And has to be instructed in how to use that. And it's turn, been turned into something that I like to think of as the spinach of life. Something that we eat or that we experience, or we do, and this includes adults, not just children, what we expect of them. Because it's good for us, because we should, because the expert has told us that that will help us in some way. And I don't want to denigrate spinach, spinach grows of America. Uh, my grandmother made a great spinach with garlic and oil, and I love it to this day. But, uh, you know, guys, I have a great way. If anybody out there wants to help with their bladder control, reduce stress, or lower their blood pressure, I've got it, i got it. I'm going to share it with all of you. It's the big secret of the day. It's called having sex, you know? And I'm thinking, I'm thinking that if we all just, you know, devote some time and energy to this pursuit, we could really have wondrous benefits. So I'm, I'm thinking it'll catch on, this whole thing about sex. But showing it in this way, just takes the fun out of it. And I realized that if you, would have, if you really wanted to get teenagers to abstain, this is the way to do it. You know, you, you know, Johnny, your adrenal levels will really be helped out if you just go in the back room and start getting it on. Oh, ma, come on. Really, I don't want to be doing that. So, it's not to make you wonder what we've come to. So the way that I see it, and my own personal way, of combating this sense of purpose and of doing things with an end result in mind is to introduce a sense of playfulness, of fun for its own sake, of doing things for their own sake because they're good, they're inherently good, we enjoy them. And the way that I do this, this sense of play, for the past nine years I've been playing music for children and their families, or as I like to say, music for children and the grown-ups who love them. So if you're there saying, 
So that's the guy under the purple dinosaur suit. Where's the nearest exit? Because I'm going to run for it. I get it. I've been there. I am not that. Not at all. Um, what I do is really simple, actually. And it involves an acoustic guitar, uh, some drums, some shakers, some props, puppets, things like that. And um, although simple, I find that these props, these, this equipment allows me to do something that is meaningful. Now, often when people will hire me to um, go to a party and play for the children or play at a zoo or play at a camp or do a concert, they just think they're getting someone that's going to come in and, and uh, entertain the children so the adults can have some adult time and they can go and hang out at the bar while the, the children are entertained. I get it. I, know, I understand that. But I don't see it that way. I see my role. I see my... My duty, my mission, it's kind of subversive, actually, is to get in there and use my co-conspirators, the children, because they're, they're inherently mischievous, as Nietzsche was saying, and use them to create community, to create fun, to create joy, and very often that sense of fun and mischief will work so that the adults get it too. So, for example, I'll, I'll start off by getting down on the floor, literally sitting on the floor so the children are at my level, I'm at their level, I'm some big jolly giant up there and they can, they can look me in the eye. And I, I let them know that it's okay. It's okay to, whatever, touch the guitar. It's okay to want to strum the strings. That's what children do. Not because it helps their fine motor skills, although it might, but because they like it. They like the sound. And I give them that space and use props like a, a silly rubber chicken. They just get it. It's funny. Is that beneficial? I don't know. But it gets them going. And they love hearing the same song again and again. Parents probably say, oh, no, not wheels on the bus again. But that's, that's the stairway to heaven for children. <laughs> you know? Do what you can. Do you know the Miles Davis version of that one? It's great. Oh, my Lord. So they don't have to be told it's good for them. They love that. So very often when I'm on the floor playing, singing, making up songs, just improv the humor, bringing them in with the silliness, and you'll see, you'll see in the background, they don't realize I'm looking at them, but the adults, I'm watching, I'm watching what's going on. You'll see that dad, he was, he was there, and he's talking to his friend, he's got his bottle of beer, and you notice that he's tapping it against his leg in time. <laughs> he doesn't even realize it, he's just, he's just talking to his friend. Time goes on, we play, we play, we're having fun, and next thing you know, He's closer. And maybe it's not just him. Maybe it's his wife, other parents. They make their way. They come into our circle. And very often I found, by the end of what we're doing, he's holding his beer with one hand and he's holding the big multicolored parachute with the other and bouncing a mon monkey puppet up and down and getting into it and he's kind of lost himself into it in the fun. And it's at that moment that that, that barrier between the adult world and the child world dissolves. It just becomes our world. And we're doing it because it's fun. It's very simple. It's almost so simple that, it's, that it, we don't see it. And uh, I first came to that realization that uh, one time I was being interviewed for an article about early childhood development and uh, music. And it's positive, beneficial effects, as if it's like medicine or something. Um, and I was telling the woman, um, yeah, well, music for children is is great, it helps with their fine motor dexterity, even though I don't really think I know what that means. And it helps with their socialization because they're playing with other people in a group. And then I, I, it was almost like I was listening to myself say this stuff. And I, and I was thinking, who is this guy saying this? What does it mean? This is just jargon. Uh, this is not me. And I finally stopped myself and I said, well, children enjoy music because they enjoy music. It's good for them, yes, but it's inherently fun. They don't have to be taught that. They don't have to be sold on the idea. The parents don't have to be sold on the idea. It's okay to just do it for the sake of doing it. And I think that's the thing. It's the same reason children like ice cream. It just tastes good. That's enough. We don't have to explain it. That's cool. They get it. Um, I want to share a story, something that happened to me a few years ago. Um, I was asked by a friend to come to her school and play for the children. I had played at their fall festival, and now I was, I was coming in to play for their Christmas holiday uh, festival. Now this is a special school. It serves children with special needs, so they have a mixture of children with Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, multiple issues of various ages. 
And um, so they had seen me before. They kind of knew my shtick, which, by the way, is my new favorite word, shtick. I love it. You know, hey, dog, catch my shtick. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I went up, and I was playing, and um, who knew? But it, we did uh, the usual Christmas songs. And um, I started to play Feliz Navidad. And uh, anybody who knows me uh, knows that my Spanish skills are uh, worse than bad. I took three years of Italian in high school, and I still can only say hello and goodbye and not well. So my Spanish is terrible. But regardless, those three chords of that song really brought something out in those children. And when I started to play that song, there was a little boy who was in a wheelchair who started to, to move his arms. And he really, you could see on his face he was enjoying it. Well... The woman was sitting beside him. I don't know if she was his teacher, his therapist, his aide. She saw what he was doing, how he was responding. And she reached over. She undid the seatbelt that he had. I think he may have been wearing even a harness to keep, keep himself up, right? And she took him out of the wheelchair. She picked him up. And he was young enough to be able to do this. And she turned him around so he was facing away from her. And she proceeded to walk around the room holding him that way. And what he did was flail his arms and his legs and dance with this look on his face of just sublime joy. And I know that I was humbled by that. And was it good for him? Did it help his socialization? I guess so. Uh, did it improve his, his motor skills? Well, he was moving, so I'd have to think that he, it was. You know, I, I can't imagine this had a a negative uh, effect on him. But did that matter? You know, in that moment when we all were watching her do that with him and watching him and being touched by that, did it matter whether it had any of that effect? It didn't. It really didn't, at least to me. That, to me, was an example of play for its own sake, of joy for its own sake, of the power of music and of community. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying that, you know, I'm some healer by, by what I do. I'm just trying to get across the sense of play as something serious, silliness. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist, and I don't play one on TV. Uh, I'm not an expert on brain functioning or cognitive whatever abilities. I just know what I've done in the laboratory of children and families with music, and I can tell you that they're powerful. Music is powerful. Humor is powerful. And that is more important than what you're getting out of it. It's good in and of itself. Music's good in and of itself. Food is good in and of itself, even if it's good for us. Joy, living, those are all important things. Um, and uh, so I'm tempted to end this talk by uh, some grandiose sort of ending, you know, tied up in a big ribbon, and then just end like that. I mean... At least that's what I was taught in, in sophomore English class. You have to have certain ways of, of giving a, a talk. Or, but I'm not going to do that. But, um, you know, I think, I think I can find a way to uh, tell you guys about something that might, might change your whole life. It might increase your endorphin levels. It might make you lead an easier life, a more meaningful life, a greater life. It may make you aspire to spiritual well-being to being more human, to more open to experience. It might lead you to the white rose of heaven. It might help you be happier. Or not. Thank you.